The weather outside doesn't look like terrific, um, but the temperature is like 21 degrees and I am boiling. <laughs> I just, I can't wait to get this video done so I can just open up the window because I'm just trying to block out all the sounds of the outside world at the moment. So if I, so if I have to take a deep breath at some point, it's because I'm really hot. <laughs> Should know by now oh well, if you don't hello i am rose and welcome back to my channel and as you already know by this point if you've watched my two other previous videos um i'm solely focusing on making videos towards my novel that means like editing my novel um writing the next draft of my novel research inspirations side right now i am going through like inspirational books research if that makes any sense like books that inspire me and that I might delve into with my own novels a little bit because of this recently with my last video I did have a really bad tendency to ramble so I'm going to be looking at my notes a lot at the time so if you see me looking down at some points it's either because I'm looking at this or I'm looking at this so I have two books here that I'm constantly looking down at so there's a pre-warning for you. So before I get into today's book, I just want to briefly mention about the recent news about Nikita Gill's book of The Girl and the Goddess. I have heard that it's becoming a TV series now. So I'm really eager to just get um, read this book now. I'm currently reading it right now. So far, it's brilliant. Um, and I look forward to talking about it with you guys in the future. Also, before I get into the review and that, I had to do two separate takes as the camera kept like stop recording at around important points. I thought that I already pressed, well I assumed of when it stopped recording because it made a clicky noise so I thought that's when it stopped recording but apparently it was a bit before so it just didn't tell me and I got <laughs> now I'm really annoyed so I have to refilm it all so if it seems a bit different at some points it's because I'm just combining them all together and if I seem a bit more differently dressed than earlier like I'm in the same clothes because I'm doing it at the same time but um, if it all seems a bit weird and a bit jumbled a little bit it is because I'm combining all videos together and I'm having to refilm it so that's why. However today we're going to be talking about another Nikita Gill book that I finished last week and it's called The Great Goddesses Life Lessons from Miss and Le uh, Miss and Monsters and I'm just going to quickly le read the blurb for you before we get into it. I watch girl become goddess and a metamorphosis is more magnificent than anything I've ever known. Wonder at Med Medusa's pundence venom, that's my dyslexia coming in, um, Ceres fierce sorcery and Athena rising up over Olympus as Nikita Gill ma magistically again, explores the untold stories of life bringers, warriors, creators, survivors and destroyers that shook the world, the great Greek goddesses. Vividly reimagined and beautifully illustrated, step into the ancient world of uh, ancient world transformed by modern feminist magic. So, as you can probably tell by the blurb, the blurb. <laughs> as you can probably tell by the blurb, um, it is solely based around the Greek goddesses, gods, and like myths and monsters around that kind of um, era. Uh, well, not era. Is it error? I think that that would be the right word uh, of that time, and it she has a different spin and take on it that will be it it will be very unique to all the previous takes because there's so many 
one of the things that I've learned about the Greek gods and goddesses is that there are so many different stories of each um, deity. Um, there are like, I think there are like multiple stories for Zeus, there's multiple stories for Hera. Like, it, like, it's sort of like around the same sort of scope of the stories, but every story that you hear about them is slightly different. So I like that she has her own inter interpretation of it. Like with the fierce fairy tales, there is a strong feminist take on it, but it doesn't surround just females, it's around males as well. And there is like kind of like a real raw take on the males in this one. One of them was actually my favorite, <laughs> just because I, I quite, I'm a bit of romantic and I quite liked how he had his ending really. So I'll get into it in a bit. And just like with the fierce fairy tales, um, Nikita Gill puts a new spin and a new, whole new perspective on each monster, god and goddess that totally makes them more human and instead of like the powerful untouchable gods and goddesses, there's just like a real rawness to each character that you can't help but like relate to on some level. But it's... she... <sighs> she completely puts a new voice to each god and goddess even the like the small gods and goddesses that you don't even really hear about like there was a few in here that i didn't even know about and i had to like google and be like oh this one's interesting let's have a little, little look <laughs> what is even more beautiful about these um this collection of stories and poems is that um the god and goddesses somehow like end up on earth in modern time and I really like this spin and she sort of sets them how their lives would be in our modern era and what's even more fascinating is that on this modern plane that they're on they either get find a happier path or the ending that they deserve and the best example of that would be with the um, king of gods the king of thunder the, 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 the god of thunder isn't it Yes, it's the, um, the, the, Zeus is the god of sky and thunder, so I was technically close and he's the king of gods. And um, yeah, he does have um, a, a few chapters in here dedicated to him. One aspect of how she puts them into the modern era a little bit with Zeus, because um, throughout the story, um, throughout his chapters, his chapters sort of align with Hera his wife um, and sister technically um <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and um he the, she places them on earth and basically um zeus on earth he becomes like a powerful man and i'm just gonna get into his chapter so i can show you what kind of ending he got he, that he deserved. When he came to earth he started off as a powerful man and it really ties in with the Me Too movement where um, he like sexually harassed and like sexually assaulted some of the women around him until one woman was like no I'm not having any of your blackmail, your disclosure agreements or your payouts, I'm, I'm reporting you. And and that sort of shows the downfall for Zeus where he's, they're banging on his door and um, they're trying to reach him and uh, I'll show you the ending of it. So every woman he had ever wronged, even God kings have to answer for their sins. Sir, a knock came on his door from his secretary. The police are here and they want to speak to you. I don't think I can hold them back much longer. They have a warrant. You will be at the mercy of the same beings you once made, made human from clay. When he did not answer, the, the knocking grew more inconsistent and more insistent. And he heard voices murmuring loud. Though they were muffled, he knows what they are saying. His head dropped for a second and he tried to think of a, someone to pray to. Come up hollow, he signed in frustration. Then he composed himself, straightened his suit and pulled himself to his height. When it happens, I hope you'll face your downfall with the dignity of a, ki of a king. She was right. She had always been right. At last, he took a deep breath and cleared his throat. Let them in. 
so yeah, he um, he gets his um, just desserts basically, um, and I felt like I felt so much satisfaction when I read that. I was just like, yes, Zeus is going down. So yeah, she she sort of like tells their stories of what it was like on Olympus for them. And then they slowly make their way into Earth and what their lives are in Earth. And I feel like that is so unique and fascinating, to be honest. Nitpicks that I can identify are um, sometimes I, <laughs> sometimes she would merge two um, myths together, which is, I think that's a really good idea. But sometimes I just got really confused because I was just like, Huh, I did not know that this this existed. I didn't know this goddess became this goddess by that. And I'll show you which one I mean. Um, where is it? I'm going to the content section because I can't remember where it is. Yes, it was... I really can't pronounce this girl's or the goddess's name. I'm just going to put it in the, <laughs> in the screen. Um, and daughter of... I can't pronounce that. I'm just going to put the whole title of this chapter in <laughs> in the um, in the screen. And basically, she can't, with this she merges two myths together. So, um, basically, this girl is um, the favoured daughter of this um, king father, and he does. Uh, I later learn he does something to upset the goddess of uh, um, Artemis. And so he, um, so he, she tells him, or he assumes that he must sacrifice a daughter to win the battle that he has to face right now. And when I read that, I was like, oh no, oh no. And like, when you're reading this, you feel so much dread right away because the first opening line, she was just like, when I was a child, I loved rainbows. And I was just like, ooh. I loved when I was a child oh dear so and then as you like at first she thinks she's gonna get married and then so you sort of like I don't feel like this is gonna be a good marriage but then it builds and builds and then you realize no it's not gonna be a marriage he, your dad's gonna sacrifice you <laughs> great times everyone to be alive basically even though she's being sacrificed to the goddess um, Artemis um, Artemis technically saves her and she became um, I Iris, the, go um, the goddess of rainbows, I believe. I I'm going to put that and say when it says yes. <laughs> and um, so she goes from this, this girl with this one name and then becomes Iris. And um, I felt like combining those two myths was very smart and very intelligent, but I was just very confused because I was like, I swear that's not... I had to like double check because I was just like, uh, is this correct? Uh, I have to double check now because I, I looked up the daughter that this myth was based on because it was actually a real myth. Um, but I didn't look up Ar Iris. Let's have a little look. She's, they're not the same person. So I, I quite like that she merged the two characters together to um sort of like give the the victim of the story more of a voice and more strength and um just made her not be a victim anymore but at the same time i just got really confused because i was like i never heard of that happening is that real so that was my only nitpick of it all but I still loved it either way. Like, I, I got confused, but I got over it. Like, <laughs> it was fine. So I'm gonna quickly go over my favorite lines of um, the Greek, uh, great um, goddesses, and then I'm gonna go through my favorite chapters. So my favorite lines are, favorite line are, is from this little chapter from what it, um, for, for called, it, it's from this chapter called, what it means to be a forgotten magic maker and it's only a brief one and it's under the series huh. series i'm gonna just gonna put the name in the title like i'm really bad with names someone has to say it to me before i can know how to say it so <laughs> uh, me reading it is not a very good thing um so series 
it's under the cerise and it's only a brief um like the first sort of line under her and it says did the girl choose maggot Ma apparently i can't speak today did the girl choose magic or does magic choose the girl an internal riddle that that circles even the fiercest of of the dinities i love that uh, just because I quite like that opening question, does does um, does the girl cho choose the magic or does the magic choose the girl? I just like it makes you feel special either way. <laughs> like I'm just like yeah. And the next favorite line is from um, Aphrodite, and it's called. It's in the chapter called Aphrodite After. And this is, this is like the story chapter of her life on Earth. So um, like in the modern era. So um, and she's spending like she has a happy life with her husband that I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of. I'm just going to put it in the title. And um, she has this, la this little um, paragraph um, and within it that says, Love can never die, not completely. There are too many romantics, too many poets, too many places where lovers could meet and kisses could be shared. And that kind of feels like there's a tingliness in your body when you read that. I'm like, ooh, yeah, love, love will never die. There's always, because it also gives, gives you hope, because even though you've been in a past relationship that hasn't worked out, love will always still be there in your present or in your future it will still be there and it's still a possibility for you. Yeah, the past relationship didn't work out for you, but doesn't mean you can't actually have a good love in the future. And I love that. And you could tell I'm just like springing up. <laughs> Third favorite line throughout all of this is once I get to it, there we go. So it's, it's not really a favorite line, but it's more like um, a few paragraphs that, um, that I really liked. It's on Artemis after and obviously it's her life on the modern earth and she's sort of adapting to the outside of the um, woods into the cities really and so this is um, this la last few paragraphs really it really built up this like warrior-esque side of me so let's read them after that, neither Artemis nor her nymphs stay in one place, stay in one city for long. Just as all forests forest once belonged to her, she adopted the street, cities too. Cities like forests can be sanctuaries. Cities like forests can be, can also be a good place to find monsters. They've adapted too. They wear human skin now, hide in bed better pla in plain sight, know how to smile and laugh, disguise their true intentions, but the Olympian in her sees through it all. The hunt has changed, the prey is different, but Artemis, Artemis's arrows strike true all the same. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> war war women warriors are out to battle, protecting other women from monsters on the streets, and I freaking love that. I love that and Nikia girl thank you for giving me that so yeah I really love that so that was kind of like my top three favorite lines or at this case paragraphs and then I'm just gonna go into my favorite chapters now and here they're in orange so <laughs> yeah I've color coded everything now so my first favorite one is Athena after and it's mainly just because it's kind of like a poem-esque sort of feel and she mentions a library, I love libraries, and she, but she, there's also like a hidden strength to um, this, so I'm just going to read like the paragraph that I've highlighted that I really like. Did you think Athena would just disappear when there are so many little girls she has yet to help, she has yet to help become warriors too? I really love this because um, I've always had a soft spot for Athena growing up and that's because when I first learned about her she was the first goddess I ever really learned about um, I quickly learned she was the goddess of warfare or war and in handicraft and practical reasoning and 
she kind of it was kind of like she was the bad up bad up bad boss bit. She just literally came in the room and she's like. I know how to win this war, all the men get out, let's do this, let's win this war, or she would come in and she would be like, I know how to end this war in a peaceful way, and um, that's really great, and I really looked up to that a little bit growing up, so it was really good to read that line, and then another line that I really liked was, um, she who reveals her she who rewards wisdom and bravery when my daughter asks how to fight monsters Athena is who I tell her to look for and it's so true because like Athena was a warfare goddess well she was a warfare goddess and she knew how to win and fight wars she was very practical and tactical like that so brilliant and I, I love that she touched upon that and Athena didn't need much in our modern world really to go go on she just needed a few paragraphs and it ended with her showing girls the library and I was like I love libraries thank you and the next chapter that I really loved was hold on was Ares after so his life um, in the modern world and um, a brief like summary of his of his chapters it mainly just goes into um, he was like the god of war so all he knows is like violence and bloodshed and you can tell from his chapters as well he's very exhausted by doing this all like yes it's all he knows but he's just like I'm even tired from it like I, I can't I can't watch any more people die <laughs> like so that's why I always say about Nikita Gill's um, books yes she's a feminist but it's, she doesn't just isn't a feminist towards women she's also a feminist towards men and just giving them a voice too so I really liked his chapters and I really liked the after one and it was mainly because he had like he expressed his loneliness through throughout this chapter like he was just he apparently was talking to well not apparently didn't at some point he was talking to Aphrodite about it and she was just like well what do you want like what do you want out of life he, he and he was just like um in his head he was like oh I want someone who stays and then he also refers to Aphrodite's relationship with her husband that I'm gonna put in the title because I'm not gonna trying to pronounce that name um he's like I want you and what your husband has and I think she was kind of like um, gonna be a matchmaker as soon as she says that says this line why didn't you say so before and then she like skips along <laughs> and, uh, I think she was about to do some matchmaking it very much ultimately really works out because that in a chapter before um, it speaks about a relationship that Ares has with this wo woman called call him I, uh, Kello, oh, um, I'm just going to put it in the screen again <laughs> um, and this woman was known to be um, write great poetry and that kind of stuff but um, in this in this book um, Nikita Gill refers to her of the goddess of great uh, of epic poetry which I had to look up as well I was just like this is one of the things that I got really confused about with her and like, I sort of had to adapt my head to. Um, she wasn't technically a goddess, but in this story she is, and I actually think that's really cool as well, that um, she gave this high high rank into this woman that has done a good amount of work, um, from the sounds of it. <laughs> and um, and they he had a sort of a relationship with her at one point, and I think they must have lost contact in this. And so Aphrodite sort of sets them up again and then um, um, he's just like, he hears her before he sees her um, and he, she's um, sort of speaking out this poetry she has to the public of modern earth and um, he's really nervous, it was just like really endearing, I was like oh, bless, he's just like oh, I'm really nervous and um, she's really calm, she has a confidence about her and she was like um, it's been a long time, Aries. Um, and it kind of feels so light-hearted, like there's hope. And he hugs her and he's just like, would you like a drink? 
And she's like, why not? We only have forever. And I'm just like, ah, oh, I ship these two now. <laughs> I want these two to be together. <laughs> and it kind of feels like there's a new start for him when that ends. And because that's the last chapter on him, I'm just like, I'm happy for Aries. I'm glad he got away from all that bloodshed and started to build a life or a happier life now with I'm going to put her name on the screen again. Um, so yeah, that was my another one of my favourite chapters. And then the last favourite chapter, um, it's called The Moon Writes a Love Letter to Artemis. And I, first of all, if anyone knows me very well, I love the moon. I wish it could write a love letter to me and I could write, like, write a love letter to the moon. Like, I love the moon. So when as soon as I saw this, I was like, yes, okay, let's get into this. So my favourite kind of like area, well, all of it was brilliant, but I think that my favourite area of it all, well, was all of it actually. <laughs> but I think I'll read the first few lines and then I'll read the last few lines so you can get sort of a feel. I choose you, the rarest of beings, for, for the belonging I never had with your Aunt Celine. She was meant to be my mother, my food giver, but I found her too in a little, too, I found too, I found her, but I found her too little in love with me and more in love with what, with watching love. But you, dear Artemis, you you with wings that make you, you, that you made from your own, from your own silver tipped wishes, how you always t just took what you wanted. I watched you become a midwife to your mother at birth and bring your twin into this world. This is what I wanted to belong to. And I was like, mm, that's so cute. And then the last like part of it was, was just saying, why else when your father sat you on his throne as, a, as an untamable girl child and asked you what you wanted, you told him, give me the moon. And I was just like, I wish I could say to someone, Give me the moon, that's all I want. <laughs> but sadly we are not gods and goddesses in this world. So I really liked that one. Um, yeah, it kind of, it also sh shed a light to the fact that not all, <laughs> not all gods and goddesses have these like great romantic love stories. And not like, <laughs> let me rephrase that. They don't have the typical great romance story. And I think Artemis sort of had the romance story of the wilderness and with the moon and just being around other women and just being her. And I think that's why everyone's a little bit more drawn to Artemis than Athena. Um, because there's she she's wild, but she's also peaceful. Like she m helps she in a way drives you to be more you and that's why the moon in this um, book has written the love letter to her. So my takeaways from this book that you should absolutely read are that myths and like legends and monsters even as well because there's a few monsters in here as well they can have so many symbolic meanings to our modern world than we actually realize and that Nikita Gill has really like um, emphasised and really like expanded as well and that's what I really loved about it and that's what I hope to sort of take away into my own novel as well like I have a few symbolic meanings as well in my own novel that I'm hoping to expand a little bit further so um, that are based on myths and fairy tales and legends so I really liked I found it really interesting how she did that with the uh, with her poems and short stories and also what I really loved is that she's basically showing everyone don't be afraid of retelling myths don't be afraid of retelling these legends don't be afraid of tapping into the emotions of these characters that were once villainized, humanize them, retell the story, make it a voice, a new voice. So she, don't be afraid of retelling it because that retelling is probably what someone needs to hear. Another thing that I think is a great takeaway, which is what I learned with Zeus, um, like I loved the ending of Zeus, <laughs> like I freaking loved it. Um, um, I think a great takeaway was um, 
learning what drives the villains of the story. Um, is it power? Is it control? Is it insecurity? What drives your villains? Like, that's what I really liked about Zeus. There was, he was driven so much by greed and power. Like, he wanted all this power and he got it, like, through bloodshed. But then it ended because a woman was like, no, we're not going to let you get away with this in our world. Thank you very much. And also, what drives this kind of, like, need to be the villain when it's like this power or like hatred like why are they wanting this power why are they want it why do they have so much hatred over what like ask yourself the questions that might be uncomfortable to ask but it will be so beneficial to your villains in the carrot in your story and it will make them feel more real and more scary because they are more real <laughs> So on that excitable note, I'm going to end the video there so you can just think and mingle on your mind things that I've just said. But um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Next week is going to be The Girl and the Goddess. Um, as you read on my previous video for The Fierce Fairy Tales, the schedule has changed slightly. So when you're watching this, it will be a Wednesday, but the next video will be next Saturday. It's just so it can like work alongside my work schedule and I'm not on a rush to edit the video because I like to take time with like editing the videos, make sure everything is exactly right and how I want it to look. And I am playing with the colour filters or colour themes of the video, so if they change slightly in each video, uh, just ignore that. I'm just playing around and seeing what kind of colour coordination or scheme that I want to go with. So, um, but until next week, I'm going to be talking about The Girl and the Goddess. Hopefully I would have read it fully by then because it's quite a big book. I didn't realise how big it was until I got into it. I was like, oh, this is going to take a while. I might need to sit back and read it <laughs> and really take it in. But I am really enjoying it so far and I'm excited to finish it and talk about it with you guys. But until then, have a great rest of the week and I'll see you next Saturday. Bye.